you have your Bible, flip over to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. We are coming to the end of our study in the book of Genesis. It has uh, been several years in the making. We've taken a couple of breaks here and there, but we are finishing this book. It feels like I've been in this uh, text for such a long time, and God has really used the book of Genesis, especially this last section on the life of Joseph, to impact my own heart and my own life in so many different ways. I've been reminded of who God is and the truthfulness of his word, the faithfulness of him throughout all generations, which we specifically see in the life of Joseph. I hope and pray God has used this passage, these passages the last few months to speak to your heart and your life. Today we reach the end and we see two people die. Two people pass away. First is Jacob. The second is Joseph. And we think oftentimes about death and we think about it in such a negative way and it certainly is sad and it certainly is painful for us to leave somebody or for somebody to leave us from this life. We mourn that. We are, are, are broken over that. We painful situations, no doubt. But I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, never fear dying, beloved. Dying is the last but not the least matter that a Christian has to be anxious about. Fear living, that is a hard battle to fight, a stern discipline to endure, and a rough voyage to undergo. Life is harder than dying. Dying for a believer means entering the presence of God. And so we have nothing to fear. For Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. What a beautiful reminder. Yet on this side, we can let the, the fears of the world and the, the things of the flesh cloud our mind when we think about death. And we can sometimes be caught up in the, uh, the idea that there's something final about that. But in the life of a believer, there's nothing final about death. It is just the doorway into the beginning of life eternal. As we look at the death of Jacob this morning, I want us to see four things that are reminders, not only about how we die, but how we live. So if you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 50, I'm going to come back in just a little bit and hit the last part of chapter 49, but for the sake of our public reading of Scripture this morning, I'm going to begin in chapter 50. So I invite you, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word in chapter 50. It says, Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of your Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atat, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning, last, uh, made a mourning for his father for seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning of the th on the threshing floor of Atat, they said... This is a griev grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim, and it is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all of the evil that we did to him. 
So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he in his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Micah, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, there's a lot of death that happens in this passage, and it's a reminder to all of us that we too will die, that we too are not going to live on this earth forever, and that what we do and who we know make a lot of difference. Father, knowing you gives us eternal life, and walking with you throughout this life reminds us of your goodness and of your grace, that you are doing things in us and around us that we could never even imagine, and that you are working all things together for your good, no matter what we find in the situations and circumstances of life. Father, there are some here this morning that are walking through very difficult times, They've gotten some really negative health reports lately. They, they found out they have cancer. They've got dementia. They've got struggles on the horizon. There are others who are struggling financially. They've lost their job. They're, they're going through a difficult patch. There's others that are here that are feeling broken. They have children that are not walking with you. They have a, a spouse that's far from you. They have a, a brokenness in their heart, an anxiety, a discouragement, Father. And it feels like that you're not drawing close to them and so, Father, I pray that no matter what season of life we find ourselves in at this very moment, that we would be reminded that you are at work. And that what feels like a great discouragement, what feels like a great pain, what feels like a great a disappointment, that, Father, you can take even the worst moments of our lives and turn them into things that bring you great glory and are for our own good. Father, I pray that you would show us that in your word this morning. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. And I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Some of the things we're going to share this morning as we finish out the book of Genesis are reminders. They're things that we've said repeatedly as we've looked at the book of Genesis, especially as we've looked at the life of, of Joseph. And the reason for that is that God has a way of using a narrative or using a life story such as Joseph to remind us of certain things over and over again. And the reason for that is because we're forgetful. Okay, I'm forgetful. Sometimes I can't remember if I used this uh, example before or if I have never shared that story uh, in, in the pulpit uh, yet. And so I can't always remember. Sometimes I write things down like points in a sermon. And I think, I think I said that a couple of weeks ago. And sure enough, I'll go back in my notes. I'm like, yes, I said that a couple of weeks ago. But the reality is you probably missed it, right? If I can't remember it and I wrote it, you probably can't remember hearing it. So it's okay that we say it again. God is, do, does that often in scripture. He reminds us over and over again. Why? Because we are forgetful people. So some of the things that you may hear me say this morning, you may be thinking, well, when we were talking about Joseph and Potiphar's wife, he said the same thing. That's because some of these truths continue to reoccur in the life of Joseph. We used this one a couple weeks ago, but it's so apt for this very moment in the life of Jacob and Joseph, and it is this. This place is not our home. I mean, this place is not our home. God did not intend for us to live on the earth impacted by sin forever. In fact, 
when the Garden of Eden, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were removed from the Garden, right? You remember that? They were removed from the Garden, and then God placed angels at the front of the Garden to protect the Garden so that Adam and Eve could not go back in. Why? Why would he prevent them from going back into the garden? Because the tree of eternal life, the tree of life was in the garden. And God did not want them to go back in, eat of the tree of life, and live forever in their sin. Instead, he says, no, I've got a better way. I'm going to provide a way in the future that your sin can be forgiven and that you will have eternal life. But it won't be from eating from that tree. It will be eating from the tree of life, Jesus the one who provides eternal life free from sin. And so this place is not our home. Look at verse 29 of chapter 49. We're going to go back a little bit. Last week we looked at the sons of Jacob and we talked about the different tribes and the different ways that God was going to bless each tribe moving forward. And so we're going to pick up there at the end of that part of the passage in verse 28. And we're going to see that Jacob did not want to die and be buried in Egypt. He, he understood, this is not what God has for me. This is not my home. God made a promise to my ancestors, Abraham and Isaac. And he said, no, there will be a land for you. And so he did no, had no intention of dying and being buried in Egypt. He said, I want to go to my home. Look at verse 28. All of these are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each one with a blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in a cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. So Isaac, or excuse me, so Jacob is saying, I don't want to be buried here in Egypt. I want to be buried in Canaan. Why? He wanted to be buried with Abraham and Isaac. Why? Because God had made a covenant with Abraham. A covenant that we read about in Genesis chapter 16, verse 6. When God says to Abraham, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into great nations. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So God promises Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great people. And I'm going to make you, and I'm going to give you a great land. That's my promise. You will be great uh, in your people, in your family. You will, nations will come from you. Kings will come from you. And I'm going to give you a land of your own to inhabit. And so, obviously, Jacob remembered that covenant. And he walks out that covenant by saying, I don't want to be buried here in Egypt. This is not the land. This is not the place God has promised. I want to be where my home is. He understood that life in Egypt was temporary. He knew that the people, of, uh, while they were there at the moment for the famine, they weren't going to be there forever. And so he wanted to be where the people were going to be forever, the land of Canaan. And so as we look at this from the other side of the cross, this is not the land that God has given us forever. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He is going to give us an inheritance in Christ in heaven forever. And so when we get caught up in the things of this world, we, and we get sucked in and we get fooled by the culture and by the media and by life and the busyness and the, the, the pride of life and all of the things that go into this, and we start thinking that this is all there is, oh, we're missing out on the Great, great truth that God has created us for a better place. That's why Paul writes to the church of Philippi, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. He says, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we waiting, awaiting the return of Christ? He says, from heaven, our citizenship, where we belong, we're waiting for Christ to return. And then it says, he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. I don't know about you, but I am pumped about that. Because in heaven, I am not going to be middle-aged middle -aged and overweight. Amen? 
I'm going to be looking good, and it's going to be great, and I'm excited about that, and you probably are as well. I'm going to be able to pull that table up at the marriage supper of the Lamb and not count any calories. It's going to be fantastic. He's going to turn this lowly body into be his glorious body. Even all kidding aside about uh, uh, looks and outward appearances, the most important part of that transformation is that I'm no longer going to have any desire to sin. I'm not going to have any temptation. I'm not going to fight any battles. I'm not going to have any health scares. I'm not going to have any sadness. There's going to be no more tears, no more sorrow. That's far better than any physical appearance. Oh, it's going to be glorious. He's going to transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. With the same power that he rules and reigns over the universe is the same power that he is going to transform us with. What a great promise. This place is not our home. Don't get sucked into the news. Don't get sucked into the Instagram. Don't get sucked into the culture, the friendships, thinking that this is all there is. I better live it up now. Oh, if this is all there is, we're, we're in a world of hurt. Oh, but there's a glorious place called heaven that Jesus says, I have gone to prepare for you. Second thing I want us to see in the text this morning from the death of Jacob is that we are to give honor to those who deserve honor. We're, we're watching the Olympics a little bit at our house at night before we go to bed. And when uh, somebody wins, they win the gold medal, they stand up on the platform and they put the gold medal around their neck and they play the national anthem. And everybody gives honor to whoever is the winner, right? They've done the best at the, at the gymnastics routine or they were the fastest swimmer or the highest jumper or whatever the uh, competition is. They give honor to that person because they deserve honor for their accomplishment, but there's some honor that we are to give in the faith as well for those who walk faithfully, to those who live out their lives in accordance with the Word of God, who, who are men and women of great character and integrity, who do a great ministry. We're to honor those who deserve honor. And here we see that Joseph gives great honor to his father. We are to honor, the Scripture says, honor our fathers and mothers. This is part of who we are. God has placed us in the family that he has placed us in. You know, we don't, we can pick a lot of things in life. You can pick what college to go to. You can pick who you want to marry. You can pick what sports you want to play. You can pick what you want to watch on TV. But none of us got to pick who our father and mother were. That was ordained by God. And therefore, they're worthy of honor because God has ordained it in his plan. Look at verse 33. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Even somebody who, with great honor, somebody who walked with the Lord, they eventually die. Everybody eventually dies. Now you might be here this morning, you might be thinking, I'm 15 and I've never been stronger and I'm healthy and I can do whatever I want. My friend, it goes like a vapor. You're 15 one day and 50 the next. It's just that fast. And your body doesn't do what it used to do. And things don't happen the way they used to happen. And then you go from 50 to 80. Just like that. It's just like a vapor. And we're all going to die. None of us know exactly when. It's not a date you can put on your calendar. It's not something that you can schedule. But you know it's coming. Some of us is coming quicker than others. And we just don't know. But here's what we do know about death. Hebrews 9, 27. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes judgment. All of us are going to die and all of us are going to stand before the God of the universe. And we're going to be held accountable for our lives. There's going to come a judgment and there's judgment that's going to come in one of two ways. It's going to come either as in, well done, my good and faithful servant. Your life has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have not remembered your sin. I have forgiven it. I have cast it as far as the east is from the west. You are forgiven. You enter into your rest. Or it's going to be, depart from me, for I never knew you. You are guilty of your sin. 
you are not pardoned because you had no faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we are going to be sent either into paradise, which is heaven, or away from God, which is a place called Hades or hell. And we will be there for eternity, for we are to die once, and then there is one judgment. There's no moving from heaven to hell. There's no moving from hell to heaven. There is one death and one judgment. And so we are to live our lives knowing that that day is coming. There's two important days that we have in our life, today and that day. Because we're not promised tomorrow and we can't change yesterday. So all we have is today and our preparation for that day. So Jacob drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Verse 1 of chapter 50. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. There's still something very sad about death. It is a reminder of our uh, uh, fragility. It's a reminder that every one of us will at some point breathe our last on this earth. And Joseph was no different. He loved his father. He would miss his father. He wept over his father. And then verse 2. And then Joseph commanded his servants the physicians to embalm his father, so the physicians embalmed Israel. Now, why? Why did he need to be embalmed? That's not a practice that the uh, Hebrews practiced. That was an Egyptian practice. But the promise that, Jacob, that Joseph had made to Jacob is, I will take your bones back to Canaan. And he knew the best way for him to get the body of, Joseph, of Jacob back to Canaan was how? By it being embalmed. So he had the Egyptians which mastered the practice of embalming to do that. And we pick up there in verse 3. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him for 70 days. Now remember, we're looking at this promise or this command that God gives us to honor those who deserve honor. And the Egyptians are now coming on board with honoring the life of Jacob. They're embalming him. They're going to mourn for him. This practice of 70 days, 40 days for embalming and 30 days for mourning. We see this 30 days of mourning practiced over and over again, even throughout the Old Testament. If you flip over to Numbers chapter 20, verse 29, it says, And when the congregation saw that Aaron, the first high priest, had perished, the house of Israel wept for Aaron for 30 days. When Moses died in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 8, it says, The people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. And so there's an embalming for 40 days. There's the mourning for 30 more days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, verse 4, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go and bury my father, and then I will return. And here's what Pharaoh said. This is is somebody who wanted to honor Jacob. Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all of the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went with him chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. This humongous group of people made this caravan up to Canaan. It kind of reminds me of when we lose a police officer or a state trooper or somebody of that uh, type of of profession and you're on the highway. I don't know if you've ever had this happen. I've had this happen a few times in my life where, um, you know, all of a sudden you look in the rear view mirror and there's like a trillion police cars back there. You're like, what in the world? So you pull over, right? Because that's the right thing to do. You pull over. And while we're talking about pulling over, I'll just give you this as an aside. Please pull over when you see a funeral procession coming by. I'm, say, I'm telling this as a pastor. This has nothing to do with the service. I'll get back to the story in a minute. But it's very dangerous because the, the escort's riding that motorcycle. 
And he's zooming past, and it's super dangerous. And if you don't pull over, it really messes with a funeral pr procession. I know everybody's busy. I know you're trying to get where you're going. But please, for the sake of safety and of all involved in honoring the person who passed, just, just pull over. That's just the side. So you're on the highway, and you see all the cop cars, and you pull over. And all of a sudden, you're like, do we have any cops that are working today? Because they're all in this professional, right? This is like this group moving up to Canaan. All of the servants of Pharaoh, all of the family of Jacob and Joseph, all of the sons and the grandsons, all, this whole bunch is moving. It's making an impression on the people of Canaan. We see that a little bit later here in verse 11. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Hattad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim, which means a meadow of Egypt. They, they named a place in Canaan after the Egyptians because they saw all of this clan coming to bury Jacob. There was great honor that was given to Jacob for his life, for his following of the Lord. He wasn't perfect, but he has a man of deep convictional faith, and he was walking out the covenant that God had given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to himself. That's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, verse 7, Pay to all who is what it owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is a, we are to honor those who deserve honor. And Jacob was honored by not only the Egyptians, but his own family. Third, guilt is an awful master. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Because you are walking with the guilt of something that happened in your life years ago. Maybe you made a, a bad choice. Maybe something happened to you and you thought, oh, that's my fault. Maybe it's a sin that you committed and you've asked the Lord for forgiveness. But man, you just keep thinking about it. And you just keep saying, oh, God can't use me. God's not going to forgive me. And you're walking in this guilt and it's become your master. You have no freedom anymore to, to live your life, to pursue the things God has in front of you because you keep living in the past of this guilt that weighs so heavy on your heart and on your mind. And I want to be the first one to say this morning, let that go. Don't walk in guilt. If God has given you his grace, don't continue to walk in the slavery of sin. He has set you free. He has cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. And it, scripture says, and he remembers it no more. If God doesn't need to remember it, you don't need to remember it. If God has forgiven you, don't keep beating yourself up about it. Look at this in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. If you were with us a few weeks ago, we already saw that Joseph had a meeting with his brothers. He already wept over them. He already forgave them. They had already had a time of, of, of grace giving and, and of remembering together and of celebrating and partying together. And he is not holding their sin against them anymore. But yet now their father has died and they're worried. They're like, whoa, maybe now that our dad has died, Joseph's going to turn on us and he's going to pay us back for what we did to him many years ago. And this is such a foreign concept to Joseph because he's like, I've already forgiven you. Like, why are we bringing this up again? So there in verse 16, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of your servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He wept to them because he had already forgiven them. He had no intention of bringing back their past transgressions against them. And my friends, God will not bring back your past transgressions. You know, one of the things that it's really hard in a relationship is when uh, you have something go wrong and there's a time of repentance, a time of confession, a time of forgiveness, and then that person brings it back up years later. Well, you remember when you hurt me? I'm like, I thought we had dealt with that. I thought we were forgiven. And when we really forgive somebody, we let it go. We move on from it. We don't use it as a weapon of the future to continue to poke people with. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness is the extension of grace. God doesn't do that in your life, and we shouldn't do that in our own lives, and we shouldn't do that in other people's lives. 
Jacob, uh, Joseph models that here. He says, swept over them. And he said, my, uh, he said, verse 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As uh, for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You intended evil, but God is so much bigger. God is so much better. He took what you were going to do for harm and he turned it into the saving of lives. So many times we can't imagine how God can use our past experiences, good or bad, to accomplish something in the future. There may be something that you've done in the past, something you've walked through in the past that you're still struggling with. What did that mean? Why did I do that? Why did this happen to me? Why did this circumstance, this situation come and impact my life in such a way? And it's only because God has not yet revealed or shown you how he's going to use that in your future. You're still in that in-between. You're still in that waiting game. And it's easy to beat yourself up in that in-between. It's easy to beat yourself up with guilt, not knowing what God is going to do in the future through that. As he's walked with you in that situation, he's not going to let it go for nothing. He's going to use that for his glory and for your good. And so he says, what you have meant for evil, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive. God said, or Joseph said, when you stole my coat of many colors and shredded it and told my dad that I was dead, when you sold me into captivity and threw me in the pit, when, when Potiphar's wife falsely accused him and he was thrown in jail, when the baker and the, the wine taster forgot the dreams that he had said to him, all of these things we keep thinking as we're reading, that's one bad thing after another. Joseph keeps doing what's right, and he keeps getting the short end of the stick. What's the deal with that? And God says, all of those things were working so that you would end up as the number two of Egypt. There's no way that Joseph could have imagined that when he's sitting in the pit. There's no way that Joseph could remember that or know that when he's being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. But God knew it, and God was working it out. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we know that all things, uh, that we know that for those who love God, all things are working together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. God is working those things out. But guilt is an awful master to live with in the in-between, so don't live in it. That's why the psalmist writes in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. He is not counting your sin against you. Oh, my friends, that is grace. Instead of walking in guilt, we've got to walk in grace. Lastly, we need to trust in God's promises because He is faithful. This is probably the theme of the life of Joseph. Faithfulness. Trust that God is faithful and that He keeps His promises. Look at verse 22. So Joseph remained in Egypt. He and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years and he saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children also of Mekor, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, listen to this, I am about to die, but God will visit you. Now at the time, his brothers are thinking, okay, what does that even mean? Things are going well. Joseph is number two over all of Egypt. The Pharaoh loves us. The Pharaoh sent a big clan to celebrate or to mourn with our, dad, our granddad's death. Things are fine in the land of Egypt. But all it takes is turning the page to Exodus chapter 1 and we realize things were not going to stay fine in the land of Egypt. This large group of people were going to become even larger and larger and God is going to fulfill his promise of making them into a great nation. And all of a sudden, the Pharaoh is not a fan of the people of Israel. The, the, people are, the Pharaoh is not a fan of Jacob and Joseph. He forgets what Joseph has done for them. And he turns against the Israelites and turns them into slaves. And so this words, God will surely visit you, probably had no impact on the hearer at that moment. But oh, they're prophetic. 
He goes on and says, God will visit you and he will bring you up out of this land to the land he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made, listen to this, he made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. It's interesting that it's two parts. There's a two-part promise, right? First, they are to remember and to say, God will visit us. And second, they are to take his bones out of Egypt and bury them with his father in Canaan. So 26, Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And we close the book of Genesis and it feels like we're on this down note. Jacob has died. Joseph's died. God is going to visit them in the future. But we don't know when and we don't know where. And frankly, we don't know why. And then we pick up the book of Exodus. Now it's always interesting that when we think about faithfulness and we think about what it means to walk in faithfulness and we think about the life of Joseph, we could probably name off four or five different things that we're like, man, Joseph was faithful in his integrity when Potiphar's wife falsely accused him. Joseph was faithful in the pit. Joseph was faithful to do what God called him to do in the house of Pharaoh. Jacob was faithful here. Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph was faithful here. Joseph was faithful there. But it's interesting what the writer of Hebrews in the hall of faith says that, J, that uh, Joseph was faithful for. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22, this is what Joseph is to be remembered by in his faith. At the end of his life, he made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his bones. No mention of Potiphar's house. No mention of feeding millions of people in Egypt and keeping them alive. No mention of his forgiveness of his brothers. What was the life of Joseph known for by faith? Pointing people to the exodus. What is the exodus? We're not going to be doing that next, but what is the exodus? It is the removal of God's people from the bondage of slavery. What is the commitment of Christ to you and I? The removing of the Christian from the bondage of sin. It's the exodus. And Joseph is known for his faithfulness to remind the people, God will surely visit you. God is not done. God will fulfill his promise of making you a great people and giving you a great land. That's the one thing we can walk away from the life of Joseph knowing that God is faithful. When all of the circumstances of life try to tell us otherwise, we go back to the word of God and we are reminded he is faithful and he will surely visit you.